Okay, Andrew. Uh, Andrew, another member of Parliament. Um, two short questions, if I may. The, the first is, you, you'll be aware that the, uh, in the field of, of research uh, around ionising sources, one of the most difficult debates there has been has been determining whether there is a low level threshold to accept uh, or not. Um, that's been going on within the OECD for some 20 years. I think I can't, I've been spoken to two provinces uh, on it myself. Um, yet you seem to rather rapidly have come to uh, a determination that there is no low level threshold, safe threshold in this field. Uh, I'd like to see the, 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 the scientific basis on which that, was, that decision has been arrived at. My second point is, in a sense following on from the observation just now, um, we live in uh, the Western world, in, in a world of electromagnetic sources, ranging from you know, the vacuum cleaner, the washing machine, the, all the tools around our houses, fast moving electric motors around us. How can you be certain that your American based controls? living in that world are genuinely controls. Would, it, would your science not be more credible if your control population were people who were not exposed to any of modern forms of electromagnetic source? If you can find them. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I mean, uh, yeah. So that kind of experiment may just not be possible. Well, of course it's possible. Yeah. Oh, you think that? Is it possible? Well, right now, I mean, I think that finding an area where you don't have information carrying radio waves is very difficult. You know, if you look at 50 years ago, we, we had radio waves, television signals, for example. And, you know, you'd have a, an antenna on top of a mountain that was carrying signals to the antenna on top of your house, and then it was hard, hardwired. And what's happened with the information carrying radio waves of the cell phone is you brought those information carrying radio waves to the street. And there are virtually no areas where you have this technology where you do not have information carrying radio waves. And that is why we are so concerned. We have a paper coming out in about 45 days that uh, draws a very strong correlation between exposure to information carrying radio waves and autism. And this will be the first paper that actually shows a mechanistic underpinning for that association. And our hypothesis there is that in the last five to eight years, <coughs> it is the high concentration of information carrying radio waves that is triggering autism in these young children who have a combination of genetic predisposition and a load of heavy metals probably associated with vaccinations. And that when information carrying radio waves are triggering active transport channels shutting down, the metals get trapped inside the cells. And then you have the environmentally induced genetic change again that carries on to the daughter cells. We have clinical data that shows that when you take the electromagnetic radiation exposure away, and you put these children through de detox, very aggressive detox over a period of 40 to 50 weeks, that the heavy metals clear based on molecular weight. The lower molecular weight chemicals clear first heavy metals, and then as the active transport channels open, you finally get mercury. And when mercury is eliminated, the symptoms begin to reverse. Andrew? What do you think of that? Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm, in, I'm intrigued, but uh, I, I still don't hear the answer uh, because your controls seem to uh, presuppose uh, that uh, any electromagnetic source that does not carry data uh, is safe. No, I, I, I'm not presupposing that. Okay, so let, let me answer that. Up at the, in the ionizing radiation window, what we're assuming is that there is some threshold for clinical effects from ionizing radiation. 
because we're all exposed to ionizing radiation by background, lightning, radon, you know, that type of thing. So that our assumption there is that there must be some safe level that does not prescribe clinical disease because we all don't have clinical disease and we're all exposed. So I'm talking about clinical, I'm not talking about disease mechanism threshold, clinical. The same is true in the ELF window. <clears throat> we know that the mechanism of harm in the ELF window is direct magnetic impact, and that, that impact is at the gap junction level, and it disrupts intracellular communication as a first level pathology. So that we have an understanding, but in both of those cases you have thresholds, practical clinical thresholds. But where you have an exposure that triggers a cell membrane reaction that is irreversible. You see, what happens is that once the, the protein sensor recognizes the information carrying radio wave, then the interpretation that this is a foreign invader leading to the closing down of the active transport channels and the consequent disruption of intercellular communication, that's irreversible. So that all you need is recognition to begin the process. Uh, Lauren Janis, I'm chairman of the Program Committee of the UK's research in this area. Uh, I'd be pretty interested in what you had to say. One of my difficulties is that I understand that none of this has yet been published. You've given us a very detailed mechanism, and obviously that could be rather alarming. But we really need your work to go through the usual process of peer review, and then we can judge what we think about it. And we just can't really comment on it until we see that process. That's not disbelief, it's the normal scientific process. And I know, for example, on the, uh, you obviously, if, if the work is published, we're going to be giving you some fairly revolutionary uh, numbers. Uh, for example, I, I'm not at this meeting, but I've still seen your presentations that are on the web uh, TV and music given that you've spoken about eye cancer. Now, there have been three published studies on eye cancers, as you know. Two of them found nothing. The one by Stang in Germany in 2001 was done on 18 cases. They found what was something they said was significant, but the author said the limitations of this study are such that we can draw no conclusion from it. So the published work on eye cancer is showing nothing. Now, if you have worked on eye cancer that disagrees, disagrees with that, we need to see it. We need to know. So I think, as far as I'm concerned, I'm just waiting until I see it all through peer review, and then I, so I have a judgment on what you're saying. I think it's very common. That, and that's, that's fair. I, you know, in the Safe Wireless Initiative, we're not about waiting. Sure. We, 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 we jump out there so that we can help people. <laughs> but your, your comments are fair. And as I mentioned this morning in our meeting, we, we have six papers now that are in various stages of uh, process. Uh, information on the cell membrane mechanism is in peer review literature. I mean, that, that's not uh, uh, that's not my work. I'd, lo I'd love to take uh, uh, credit for it, but I can't. Uh, that's out there. Um, the free radical work is out there. Uh, the intercellular communication work is out there. So, uh, you, know, you, you know, don't uh, uh, make the uh, conclusion here that uh, we're just guessing. We're, we're, we're not guessing at all. What are you going to do about it, Professor Johnson? What perception? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Alright, Michael no, Cox keeps saying there is no evidence. Go on. We're sick of it. Tell us again, go on. I'm, uh, we have done the volunteer studies, yeah. um, six volunteer studies, and they are, I hope all of them will be published by men. And not all of the yet have been peer reviewed, but the indications are that neither on sensitives or on controls are we seeing any short term effects. We looked at a wide range of physiological effects and cognitive. Now, maybe we're doing the wrong experiments, but they will be reported and people can comment and give us advice on the right experiments. That's the short term. Now, the difficulty is that short term effects don't necessarily tell us what long term. There have been two recent uh, epidemiological studies. One on glioma, which is a malignant brain cancer, 
one on acoustic neuroma, which is a benign cancer just outside the brain on the acoustic nerve. Both these are finding an increased risk. However, the authors of both of these say, A, it's barely significant, it could be due to chance. You are asking people who are ill to remember how much they actually use the mobile phone for. Not easy. And even the statistical says this could be in the 4% chance it could be due to chance. 4% possibility. <laughs> the other possibility is we call bias. You're asking somebody who's ill to remember which side of the phone, which side of the head they use the phone. And we know from other sources that sometimes there's an inclination to want subconsciously to blame the cause on an effect. So there may be a bias which says, well, I use it this side where the tumor is, didn't I? Mm -hmm. So what the authors of these papers are saying <coughs> is that maybe in effect we need to follow it through, and I entirely agree. So to answer Dr. Gibson, one thing we're doing is to recommend that we carry out an epidemiological study which is free from bias, and which will pick up other diseases, not only brain cancer and acoustic neuroma, but Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, motoring, neuron disease, all sorts of diseases that might be affected by mobile phone. And I believe that's very important. The other thing we want to do is look at children. And you've already commented on children. I entirely agree that children are much more sensitive to a whole range of what many call insults, things like lead pollution, things like ionizing radiation, they react differently, things like skin uh, sunlight, they react differently. Possibly even, as you say, there is some epidemiological evidence of childhood leukemia being affected by uh, magnetic fields. It's still, uh, still uncertain, but the evidence is there, we have to explore that. So I think we want to look at children. So those are the two priorities I think the UK should be looking at. There are a number of others. It may be from the discussions I've had this morning that we shall have some ideas of what more we can do on sensitives. Uh, yes. Which obviously is an issue at the moment we've done what we can. Maybe we haven't done the right things. We need to talk more and think about it. So to answer that, that's what we want to do. Where's the money coming from to do those kinds of research? Well, we're looking for we want, as we do with the MJHR program, we want to have joint funding from government and industry with a file. As we did in the present MJHR program, we tell sponsors, different government agencies, different industrial companies, broadly what we want to do. Uh, we can't expect them to fund things unless they do broadly. <coughs> Once they've signed the contracts on that basis, they have no role whatsoever to play in the choice of the programs, in the management of the programs, the publication of the data. They are we completely firewalled from our sponsors and both industry and government who want it that way because people don't believe research is funded by either of the sponsors. So the independent, yeah. We must be independent. And I think we are. Okay. Yes.